I wasn't being paid to do it. It was something that was volunteer. I did it outside of uh, my my day job. It was uh, I was a QA engineer at, uh, for the past few years, and so you know, doing these communities did come easily. There was a lot of trial and error, a lot of back and forth with volunteers. Uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, asking to pick my brain and saying they wanted to do some things for the community and then not following through. You know, which was which is always hard to. So 
culture of your company. You're fostering avenues for continued learning and improvement for tech workers um, in your city. And you're also letting your city know that you care about the ecosystem of the tech workforce outside of your walls. And, but you know, really, all of these are awesome reasons to get involved. But bear in mind that not every one of these goals is going to fit within the mission of the community organization you want to support. So as an example, Rural Development, uh, the local chapters are run entirely by volunteers. And because of this, you know, building strong support community partners is really key to the success of each of these chapters. Uh, Sylvia Pellicor of uh, GDI Raleigh uh, speaks really highly of a local uh, sponsor. She said, they are helpful to us and our community first and sell themselves second. The recruiting and sales pitches are there but respectful and appropriate. So if you're hel a helpful community partner, that makes community organizing easier for these volunteers and in turn, they're going to happily sing the praises of your company. So I want to give you a guide on some things you need to know to ensure you can provide the support of this that this community is going to need. So when you meet with this organizer, um, there are some really key questions you should ask. You know, first, you know, obviously, tell me about your community. What is the demographic of the type of people that attend your events? Uh, what is the group's core mission, and what are the most pressing goals? What are you trying to achieve with the work that you're doing in this community? What are three concrete things that your group needs the most to be able to achieve these goals? And why are you doing this work? You know, what is your background? What are your personal career goals? You know, everyone that's doing this community work has uh, a personal reason why they're doing it. Maybe they just, they, they really want to help people, but also maybe they're trying to advance, sort of advance their career and pick up new skills. So after these initial questions, you're super happy, you're super stoked, you're excited about the community, uh, the goals align with, with your own, um, you found some things in Greece that you think you can help them with, um, the organizer is super passionate and really excited. Um, but, you know, hold up, because as a company with skin in the tech game, it should really also behoove you to ensure that you're supporting a community that is inclusive. Um, you know, there are many resources out there for ways to increase diversity in tech, but just as many examples of tech communities getting it wrong. So if your company is committed to hiring diverse engineering teams, it's imperative for you to support community groups that are also committed to promoting this inclusion within their communities. Conversely, you really don't want to make the paw of uh, supporting a community group that is actually known to be a toxic place for people uh, who are in marginalized groups. And so if these people are avoiding this community and your company starts supporting them, they're also going to avoid your company. So you don't want that. Uh, a really good example of that is LambdaConf earlier this year. Uh, there are the conference, you know, for those who haven't seen this, you know, controversy. The conference chose a keynote speaker with ties to white supremacy. And this caused a lot of public outcry. And all of the sponsors who were billed on the conference started to receive an onslaught of emails from people begging them to pull their support. So after they announced this keynote speaker, within a few days, the conference lost almost all of their sponsors. And, uh, you know, without saying the names of any of these companies, you don't want to be the person at the company who starts getting this lot of emails. And if they had up front sort of asked the conference, you know, what is their policy around the type of people they ask to speak, what is their code of conduct, what do they do, uh, they could have avoided that PR nightmare. And so nobody wants that. So once you've decided that a community is really awesome, there are some more questions that you should probably ask before you put your name uh, in the lineup with that. So first, obviously, you know, do you have a code of conduct and diversity statement for your community? Do you have a policy against teachers, host organizers, using sex, sexualized images, activities, or other material at your events? What strategies are you employing to ensure that your community promotes inclusion and diversity? And what percentage of your speakers, say, in the last 12 months have represented a diverse group? And the last question, is there alcohol at your community events? And if do provide alcohol, do you have an alcohol policy around that? And do you ensure that non-alcoholic beverages are also available? So the next theme, make it easy to request support. You know, once you have a community that you want to support, um, you really want to make it easy for them to sustain themselves by giving them the tools they need to get the resources that you've, you know, promised to them throughout time. So find, your, find ways to make yourself available to these new 
events also gives companies the potential to meet candidates face to face in a more natural environment. So one great way that you can make it easy to support these groups is, uh, you know, have a form that they fill out on your website. Um, GitHub does a great job of this. Actually, they have a community section of their website where if you're putting on an event, you put in your uh, request for the kind of support that you need, and then GitHub can let you know, you know whether you're able to fulfill it and the time frame you gave them. Um, this is really awesome because not only is GitHub making it easy for community organizers to get what they need from them, but they're also creating a, a funnel where they can easily see at the end of the year, you know, what the full impact of their company was on the community, how many people they reached, and you know what that did for those community members. So money is a great thing, and uh, you know most communities need money to do something. They need something that they help our community grow and, and be sustained. But sometimes it can create more headache than, than it's worth. Um, as a volunteer, you know, trying to track money in and money out and budgeting and account, doing the accounting involved with uh, processing donations can be a lot more work than you can handle. So sometimes when it's supporting a tech community, the best thing you can do is actually just do some of the work so, they so the community doesn't have to. Um, so you can take care of purchasing some of the things that they need and just, you know, alleviating that burden. So if you're not sure where to start, um, a really great place to just you know get the ball rolling is buy snacks for the events. Um, you know every tech community or every you know uh, meetup loves snacks. It's great to have a little bit of extra food uh, to keep the brain power going, and that's an easy place for you to just make it. Just have your name involved and you know add an extra perk to the community event. Some other great ideas for things you can offer. Um, Offer space. If your company has a really awesome conference room, um, you know, this offering tables, chairs, mics, Wi Fi access is just critical to a community event. Um, you could also donate game tags, power strips, stickers, button maker, um, owner laptops. You know, there's a ton of things that communities need that if you have extras and these things laying around, it will be huge for them. Some sort of larger scale things you can do um, be the one to communicate or to coordinate the logistical stuff for the menu. So the community organizer doesn't have to. Um, by doing this emotional labor of reminding everyone what their needs are going to be on site, you allow that organizer to just really focus on the content of the event. Donate swag. Um, you know, everybody loves free stuff, and when people are walking around with your company's name on their, you know, on their shirt or on their bag, uh, that's an awesome cheap marketing way for you to spread your word, spread the name of your company around. Lastly, you know, you can provide the group access to corporate discounts when possible. So, uh, an example of that, local lodging for out-of-town speakers or event judges. Um, if you're appropriate for your business, if you offer a service that the community can uh, take advantage of, then maybe provide a way for them to apply for a free or discounted uh, subscription to that service. So outside of just giving things to the community um, for one event, for a couple of events, um, another way that you can really be, help them be sustainable is to think long term. So find ways to sustain this group that uh, you know, really benefits uh, you, but also helps them with more than just one really big event. You know, unless that group really has a goal that they're working towards and they need to raise money for that, uh, you know, helping them to sustain themselves for the next year or a few years is an amazing impact. So Jan Lenhart of Hoodie and Couch TV said, the best thing companies can do to help communities and events is to act selfless and not look for a direct return on investment. The return always comes and usually with greater value than would have been achieved with strict ROI considerations. So one simple way of doing this, you know, back to snacks, you know, just commit to providing them once a month for a year and then have someone that community organizer can check in with to, to get them dropped off or ordered, and then they can say for all of their meetups that year that they have snacks available. You know, another great way is to offer dedicated space to the group that they can use every month, and even better, pre create a portal that they can actually uh, see if when the space is available and book it without having to email you. Um, and the greatest gift that you can give to any community organizer is encouraging your employees to participate. So, uh, you know, this is a final theme. And, you know, obviously I'm preaching to the choir here. You know, everyone who's here is, uh, you know, here because they're excited about the tech community. They, they, they're here to learn. But I'm willing to bet to bet there are people here today who had to use personal time to attend this event. Uh, there might be some people who didn't tell their bosses 
bosses they're coming because they don't want their company to think they're looking for a new job. Um, and so, you know, encouraging your employees to participate in the tech community, you know, may seem like a no-brainer, but there are a lot of companies out there who discourage their employees from participating. And so, you know, there may be a lot of reasons for that. It's possible that you've been burned in the past, you sent a, uh, an employee to a conference and then they got recruited and, and left. Um, but, you know, I don't think anyone has ever heard of someone who, you know, was really happy at their job and just got swept up by some grieving, thieving rival company uh, and, you know, got stolen away. You know, these folks had already decided to make before they got there. Tasha Scott said again, you know, bonus points, consider attendance of tech community events as training hours and let your company attend, or let your employee attend on work time. You'll be investing not only in the skill of your employees, but in their work-life balance as well, while keeping impact to the training budget low. So I don't know if you can see the Dilbert cartoon, uh, but I really like it. It's like the meat evil pointing their boss. He <laughs> says, put me in training to keep up with technology trends. And one of his employees says, me. And he turns to him and says, you're fired. I only want people who already know how to do their jobs. And he says, I didn't see that coming. And his coworker says, they don't have class to fix that. So, skilled, passionate technical workers are a precious resource to any tech company, and there are endless reasons to encourage them to be part of the community. If you're tight on training dollars, encouraging your employees to participate, uh, you know, helps them to gain knowledge, training, and productivity resources. And if the events are after hours, this, this doesn't cost you anything. So, Laura Mitchell, PHP uh, Northwest Conf, and who's also an author and a speaker, said, I tend to tell people that the community will help them scale up and also make the connections for their next step. So, for you, as someone who works, if you work for a company that's hesitant to let you attend, you know, this could mean, like I said, following your passions in your own time or in the evenings and weekends. Um, you know, this isn't possible for everyone. Unless your company is supporting you, it's difficult to have time if you have families and other you know, things going on that are outside of tech that you need to take care of. But if you have the ability to pay off, will make the extra personal development time worth it. So the best piece of advice I received from folks who had sense hesitation from their managers is don't ask permission. Your employer is not paying you for your free time. Rob Hill of Vermont Code Camp and Hack VT said, honestly, there's a big aspect of not asking of my employer to do it. It's part of how I stay engaged in my career. He also said, I'm way more interested in building a healthy and supportive community than meeting the needs of any one employer. So for team leads and managers, take note. If you let these passionate people do these things, they can, if you don't let them do these things, they are going to do them anyway. So why not encourage it? and even smarter, allow yourself to benefit from it. Depending on the event, you could offer comp time to your employee in return for them reporting back to the rest of your engineering team. Um, you could ask them to post a recap session from the conference, write a blog post for your internal blog, um, host a viewing party at one, one or two of their favorite talks if there was a video at the event, uh, or even give them training on a skill they learned. So these people not only get to benefit from learning these skills, but your whole team benefits with a distilled version of the content that they found most applicable to your team. So in closing, you know, in all truth, this talk is a selfish one for me. Um, in doing this work, I've seen a lot of amazing community organizers get burnt out. You know, they did so much work, they had you know amazing sold out events, but they felt alone. They were doing most of the work themselves. And uh, you know they burnt, they just burned out. They flashed the pan, and then that community goes away. So without any successor or other people supporting them in this work, um, your city you know loses a valuable resource. So I think every successful uh, community organizer deserves a break, and also you know dirt deserves to be part of a community who's willing to step in and help give them that time. 
just volunteer work and organizing one meetup next month, or you know, buying pizza for an upcoming meetup that's happening. You're, you know, just taking one thing off their plates that they don't have to do, and really repaying a small fraction of the benefit you earn from these events. At the very least, 